trainer, he has lectured in many colleges and universities and held workshops in nine countries. He has traveled all the way from San Francisco to talk about inner peace and well-being. Please join me in welcoming Jay. Dana, thank you so much for welcoming me. Thank you for having me here this morning. Uh, you may able to hear me. Yes, I guess you are. Okay. So how can I just take this out and just walk a little bit? How's that? Oh, better. <laughs> so bright and early in the morning, mm -hmm. you're really here to hear about this into happiness, huh? Right, so um, we have 15 minutes, as I understand, so we're going to whip through this <laughs> lesson on happiness. And uh, the first question I have for you all is, think about a moment in your life which you would define perhaps as the most happiest or one of the most happiest moments in your life. And if you're ready, you can share them with us. Yeah. Getting married. Getting married was one of the happiest moments. Great. Okay. What else? Yeah. Birth of two kids. The birth, uh, birth of, of the two kids. kids. Yes. Okay. Great. Yeah. My dad survived cancer. Yeah, it's a cancer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, my son recovered from a late back surgery. He was the first time walking the stairs. He recovered from the back surgery yeah. the first time he made it upstairs. Yeah. Right. Um, anything else? One more? Yeah. He said he was baptized. You baptized? When you were a child or a child you were baptized? No, I was older. When you were older, you got baptized. So it was the happiest moment of your life. Great. Okay. Right. So, so what we're going to talk about today is primarily these uh, things around happiness. First of all, common myths about what one perceives to be happiness. We talk about uh, realization that debunk <coughs> us from these myths. We're going to talk about what contentment and joy has to do with happiness. And then the shift from the myths to actually living. And then the ultimate, hap ha ultimate happiness too. Hopefully we will get to this point where you have enough time to uh, spend time with it, which is, uh, we talk about it being an internal job and how to cultivate the happiness, okay? So, this is a quote that I really like and I want to start the presentation with this quote. It says, one of the reasons why the real and lasting form of happiness is so rare in this world is because we tend to grow up in a culture that confuses happiness with excitement. And then we set off on a lifetime's pursuit of some form of stimulation in the belief that it will give us, make us, bestow upon us happiness. Right? So the sages and the saints of different cultures and traditions uh, have been telling us that happiness is somehow that already there. And something seems to be standing in the way and we need to figure out what that is, and then when we get out of the way, we are naturally happy. Which some of you talked about, you know, the birth of children, for example. There's a very good example of how some within us, within the four of us, we tend to be happy people already. Anyway, somehow that gets foggy as we do this thing called this growth process, learning and. Uh, supposedly becoming these uh, sophisticated creatures that we could uh, call adults, right? And then all we need to do is to clear the path and from between our heart and our head and then we realize that it will emerge naturally. So the three essential steps, the first step I talked about is debunking and dispelling this myth, these myths around happiness. So we'll talk about what those myths are. So the first myth is that happiness is somehow 
directly proportional to your purchasing power. Mm -hmm. Another common thing that uh, we somehow are raised in cultures, traditions, no matter where you are in the world, most places. Everybody remembers that uh, scene from uh, The Gods Must Be Crazy. Remember that movie? And when the Coke bottles falls from the aeroplane? <laughs> Those of you who see the movie, are, I can see the smiles of your face, you recognize this, right? So the second thing is, happiness is dependent on how much one can accumulate. Folks, this is another very common myth that I've seen, that is somehow propagated in cultures across the world, right? Not only do we have the purchasing power, but we hoard. We hoard so much so that we don't care about what happens to the fellow next door to us, right? What happens to the man across the street? It's all about me trying to secure the assets for myself and for my future generations. Which, if you have any experience in life, that is clearly not directly proportional to happiness. We see a lot of people with a lot of wealth, a lot of people with a lot of purchasing power, a lot of people who have accumulated uh, for seven generations who are uh, not somehow uh, <laughs> reflecting, oozing that happiness. And happiness has to be earned. This is one of those things that we, some cultures, some traditions, they tend to say that you have to work really hard. <coughs> and when you work really hard, you deserve happiness. Yeah? And happiness is the achievement of your dreams and desires. Right? So there's a very interesting thing that uh, I read in an in a editorial section of a newspaper one day. It was just randomly picked up. I don't, I don't even remember the last time you guys picked up a newspaper. I hardly pick up newspapers. But this one time I was sitting somewhere and I read this article and it was talking to some sort of a philosopher who was talking about, you know that moment when we aim for these things called, you know, our goals and desires, right? So we aim for some, achieving something. It's that little moment at the moment when we achieve that. So let's say I wanted to get that, you know, some car, or you want to buy the house, or you wanted to win that medal, or achieve that degree, or whatever it is, right? So, the moment that occurs at the point when you just satisfy that desire and before the next desire kicks in, it is that sliver of moment when we experience that sense of being content. You see? So it is not really the achievement but the state of lack of a desire that is seemingly that moment that makes us really happy. Okay? I thought that was pretty profound. Uh, and happiness is always in the future, right? So it seems to me, <laughs> those of you who've grown up in those cultures, and I have, I particularly would expel you, when you grow up in a, an Eastern culture, you know, first they want you to just graduate from fifth grade, right? Mm -hmm. Then the next thing, at the end of fifth grade, you just want to graduate from high school. That's all, we just want you to graduate from high school and then everything will be fine. <laughs> you get to the end of 12th, uh, you know, uh, high school, you want to just get through your undergrad program and then just get through your master's program and hopefully they don't push you to PhD. In my case, they didn't. And then they just want you to go get a great job and they just want you to have that, you know, lovely two kids or they just get you through college for those two kids. It never ever seems to say, okay, I'm there, I've arrived. It's always sometime that is always in the future, and that is it. Sort of a you know, dog chasing its own tail, seems like. Uh, happiness is only possible when everything is perfect. How many people live in that society <laughs> where everything is just perfect? Perfect, yeah, you do? Okay, great. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad you at least feel that. You try, yes, that, yeah. So that's that's a completely different thing than where everything is in externally is perfect. Yeah, you try to you look at it. I'm gonna talk about that in just a second. Happiness is dependent on others. Folks, I should probably put this number one. I feel the way I feel because the way my mom treated me when I was growing up, the way my brothers treated me when I was growing up, where, uh, the way that, you know, uh, my uncle or my best friend or somebody else, what's happening right now? Okay, here's a mantra for you. If you want to take away one thing from this session, the world, 99% of the world writes by this phenomenon. 
How do I feel is based on what's going on. How I feel, what's going on, so therefore how do I feel. What I'm here to talk to you about today about is how do I feel, therefore what's going on. Okay? How do I feel, therefore what's going on. So happiness is not dependent on other others. And so like the lady said there, it's the, this 14 year old had this wonderful quote, being happy doesn't mean that everything around you is just perfect. It means that you've decided to look beyond the imperfections and look at the things that are really going well. Look at things that are going for you. Okay? Look at all the things that you've been blessed with. Right? So, let's talk about the next essential step for happiness, that exploring the deeper meaning of happiness in order to affirm three realizations. So what are these three realizations? Number one, that happiness is an inside job. Happiness is not something that you buy at Target or Walmart. Happiness is, if, if you could, then there would be all those people who afford it a lot and who have a lot of purchasing power, who have, who could have just gone ahead and bought endless amounts of happiness. If you, I take three examples that i just seen in my life, or well, not really in my life, but I've read and seen in my times. So there are some very famous stars that I can think of, both from an entertainment and uh, media personalities. Elvis Presley, Marilyn Monroe, Michael Jackson, right? So these are people who, with whatever they touched, became gold, <laughs> platinum <laughs> production, right? These are people who have amazing purchasing power, amazing amount of wealth. They could get whatever they wanted on this earth. But just look at the way they left this world. Right? Clearly, this thing that you have out there is not at all proportionate to this thing that we are set out in lifetime's journey, which is to find happiness. Right? So it is not a, an outside job, it is a something that seems to be a matter of insight. We'll talk about this some more. And happiness is not excitement. Yay, I'm going to the theme park today. Yay, somebody's going to bug it, you know, bought me flowers today. Because the opposite of excitement, because excitement lasts so long, it is an emotion that will, you know, stay as long as that particular, um, you know, so high, and the opposite of that is going to kick in pretty soon, right? This is all just there to stay which is what I talk about here. Happiness is not a state of a high, which obviously has a antonym, which is a low, an opposite, which is a low. Right? Happiness is a steady state of being. So what does a steady state of being look like? So here's, an ex here's a quote from the famous Beatles man. He says, when I was in grade school, they told me to write down what I wanted to be when I grew up. I wrote down happy. And the teacher said that I didn't understand assignment. I told him that he didn't understand life. Okay. So what is, so we talked about all the things that what happiness is not all along, right? So now let's get into that phase where we talk about, so then what is happiness? Happiness is constitutes of two things that I, um, find is uh, what if you want to understand these two things and one can spend time cultivating these two things one is going to have raised their natural state of well-being and happiness so number one it's a state of undisturbable contentment okay. contentment we'll talk about what that means now when I use the word undisturbable contentment people will think oh my god what I mean does anybody have is that, is that even possible? It's like, you know, guys, I tell you, if you're so, you know, good health, you go to a doctor, they say, you know, drink five gallons of water a day, exercise 30 minutes, you know, three, at least three to five times a week, right? I mean, sleep eight hours. And you, you can argue as, as much as you want and say, you know, all of this just, you know, it's just not possible. Well, you know, I have to watch TV late night, you know, I've got kids to take care of, I've got homework, whatever, right? You can argue as much as you want that these things are not achievable, but at least I want you to understand in this session <clears throat> what are the ingredients that are the key components. At least know what you're shooting for, and <laughs> then there's a possibility of 
going down the path and ultimately <coughs> cultivating enough of uh, um, focus and you know, uh, attention that you know where there is the effort needs to be made to be able to cultivate happiness. So the two things that I <coughs> that I want to focus on is um, contentment and joy. Right? So what are the, what do these words mean? Right? So this is such detail. These are not terms that I you know grow up in in school learning about contentment and joy. That's precisely why I'm here. <laughs> because we don't talk about such elemental, fundamental, essential part of what it means to be human in most of our you know, learning process. So, contentment is possible when we reawaken the awareness that everything near and far in this world is exactly the way it is meant to be, right? A sense of surrendering to acceptance of what is, not necessarily what it is according to my standards and my benchmarks, but accepting what is as is. And exactly it is meant to way, be in the way it, it is in the moment now. And there is only one moment, right? So it is not something that I try for achieving then, somewhere, somehow, at some point in time. I realize that the only moment that I have is truly now. And you're able to accept everyone as they are at every moment in every situation. So what does that mean? That we create act okay, so accepting everyone as they are at every moment. So we talked about that earlier, I think the lady also mentioned it, that it is not that they are perfect. Nobody is, not even neither am I. But there are specialties, there are qualities, there are virtues in every person. And if I can put my attention on that. I mean, there's hundreds of different attributes to every individual, but if I can focus on that, automatically what it does is it makes me recognize and respect that person, which does the opposite, also has an opposite effect where that person begins to respect and recognize my virtues and talents, because it's already putting a positive energy in that relationship. And then there's a third thing that happens, which is we tend that when we focus on something, that tends to revolve on us. Whether it's your negativity, whether it's personal negativity, or it's, it's virtues. So, when I focus on somebody's goodness, I subconsciously will begin to embrace and embody those virtues. So we create actions aligned with what is true within ourselves so that we can make the most effective contribution to the world. This requires, folks, this requires some amount of spending time with oneself. I experience contentment when I'm doing, when my walk is aligned with my talk, is what I'm trying to say here in this bullet point. And when my walk is aligned with my talk, I can only do that when it's really, it really means something to me. And I tell you folks, from experience, without going into all the details, we don't have time. I have talked about these topics to people in my groups, which sometimes they're 80 year old people, when I talk about these things like, who are you? What is your purpose in this world? What's your value system? They'll stare at me as if I'm talking Zulu or Swahili. <laughs> <laughs> nobody, well, most people, I shouldn't say nobody, most people haven't spent time understanding these fundamental aspects themselves. And this is something that, again, it does not require a lot of training, lots of hours. It requires a certain amount of quiet space in your life. Just intermittent 5, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. You take just time out when you're not having an iPod flipping, flaring in your ears, when you're not playing your Xbox or not staring at TV watching those endless ads. It's just quiet time between things, maybe going for a walk, maybe running the treadmill, maybe just, you know, waiting for the bus or riding the bus even, just a reflective process, which I'll kind of give you a hint on, where one understands, once you start to ask yourself, who am I? What am I here for? What is my value system? What, what really means something to me? What's my purpose? Why am I here in this world? In each one of us, I tell you folks, we are all facets of this beautiful mosaic, they're all different, 
You could have twin brothers or twin sisters, and both of you do you realize that your purpose in life, your understanding of what is your alignment with your highest purpose is going to be slightly different. And your mama can't tell you this. Your best friend cannot tell you this. Your teacher cannot tell you this. This is something that one has to find out for oneself. And then, that is an amazing thing that in the process of when you are doing things that are aligned with what you're here for, the universe, the energy, works through you to manifest that which you wish to do. Life becomes a whole lot more meaningful and a whole lot more easier when you walk in your path. And your path is whatever your path is. It's not, you know, it's not my path. It doesn't have to be my path. It doesn't have to be your best friend's path. Choices in life become so much easier when I have pre-meditated, it's interesting word, right? Pre-meditated, right? I've already figured out what is my purpose. And when I have this instantaneous moments, click, don't click, buy, don't buy, do, don't do, go, don't go, say yes or say no. Instantaneous moments, you don't have that time to, at that point, sit down and look at all the pros and cons of life, right? You will make choices that align to what is your purpose, and you, chances are you'll regret a lot less, oh, I wish I didn't go and hang out with this, you know, whatever, I wish I didn't go and buy this, I wish I didn't. There's no that, that regret, because you see, subconsciously, you've already said, this is my priority, and anything that falls in line, when I get the choices, does this fall in line with what my priorities are? Does it fall in line with what my value system is? If it does, do it. Chances are, it's going to take you one step further in that direction. So, contentment comes about when you create, when your actions are aligned with what your true sense of yourself is and what you're here to do in this world. And one more point before we want to enjoy, that in contentment, others are seen not to be, when, when others are seen not to be acting in alignment with what is true, uh, with what is true in them, our response is not of judgment, but one of compassion and understanding. You see, when you start working on the self, when you start understanding yourself, you realize that it's, you know, it's, it's a process of stumbling and moving, stumbling and walking. It's not, it's not, you know, a walk in the park by any means. So when you, when you have done this introversion or self-reflection, you begin to feel for the obstacles in others' ways and not be a one of judgment, but be one who has compassion for this. And I tell you folks, compassion is a major contributor to one's state of contentment, which then has becomes a major contributor to one's state of happiness. So the next thing we talked about is unbridled joy. So what is joy? Joy is only possible when our life flows into the world free of any desire for, our, for any part of that to flow back towards us. Think about those times when you give unselfishly, unattached uh, to the result that I should be recognized, I should get this back in return, this particular remuneration. The greatest joy is when you find your purpose, when you're living your life's, you know, uh, purpose, it comes from a state of abundance and not because you're paying me this much, you're saying this to me, you're going to do this for me, you're going to buy me this, you're going to uh, uh, honor me in front of people, you're going to say good things about me in front of people. And our deepest joy is when we are being creative. Creative, not like you know, writing poetry or writing songs. It may be for some of you, but when that creativity, creativity is aligned with the truth of who we are, and we are, that is our identity and what we are, which is our nature. We are being creative with our identity of who we are and our nature of what we are. And that creativity could be anything. For me, as an example, so you guys put this into context, is to help people understand their life's purpose, or help people to find themselves, to understand who they are. 
and find peace and joy just in the state of being who they are, not having to because they have got something, have to get something, have to buy somewhere or be somewhere. Right? In this moment, this is a moment in history. This is what the, now it's been called by many of the scientists, it's the age of distraction. The Twitters, the Facebooks, the text messages, the emails, the, the YouTubes. <laughs> The list is growing every day, right? So every moment of our quiet time, the time that we have for ourselves, our grandparents had plenty of that, even just in you know, the past 25 years, we live in a stage where we're constantly distracted. No time to reflect on some of the fundamental things and we live in a state of time where the technology, advancement in medical science is at its greatest levels, stress levels, are also at their greatest levels, frustration levels, divorce rates, teenage pregnancy, all of these things are spiraling in a direction that is getting uncontrollable. And I find it very important to help people to create space, very important to help people to slow down. This stuff is not sustainable. Mark my words. This bombardment of technology or adoption of technology is not humanly sustainable. I was giving a workshop at a hospital about 10 days ago in California. Uh, 60 doctors signed up, 100 doctors showed up at the, at the talk. And I asked them some fundamental questions. I tell you folks, and I'm talking about doctors because they are supposedly responsible for our well-being. We really are, but you know, so we subscribe, we outsource our, our well-being to these folks. They, the doctor, the medical profession is very, very sick. They're tired. They are frustrated. And if the doctors who are supposed to be helping us heal, helping us to recover, helping us to strengthen revitalize ourselves, if they are a frustrated, tired, exhausted, anxious bunch, distracted bunch, it just flows downhill from there. You know what I'm saying? So we take responsibility for our own well-being. And you might have studied this or heard this, if you haven't, then you hear it now. 80% of all diseases are psychosomatic. 80% of all diseases are psychosomatic. It's got a direct relationship with how I feel. How I feel, nothing to do with my vital statistics. I'm talking about how I feel here. And that's why when you talk about any of the contemplative practices, the Eastern traditions, the ones that have been there for thousands and thousands of years, and we talk about fixing this, how you're feeling, how you're thinking, has got so much to do with your physical ability, how you heal oneself, starting with your thoughts. So, creating the most appropriate response. This is, this is a fantastic thing. So one of the things about joy is creating the most appropriate response to meet the needs of the people near you and in the world around you. Somebody asked this question about what is intelligence? I see that tied to this. Intelligence is not about studying at Stanford University and getting a PhD in, you know, molecular biology. Right? It's not about understanding the stars and the astronomy. It is quite simply the ability to understand what to say, when to say, and how to respond to the person in front of you. Do you guys get that? Intelligence is the ability what, when, and how to respond to the person in front of you. That is the greatest intelligence. So creating the most appropriate response to meet the needs of the people in around you gives you a sense of joy. Because it creates a relationship, it creates an energy flow, it creates a sustainable you know, uh, rapport that one feels a great sense of joy. And when you are in what they call, what psychologists call the flow, when you are in the flow, 
you just get some of your naughty pets, you get it. When you're in the flow, you stop looking at the clock. When you're creating with alignment to your who you are and what you are here for, you stop looking at the clock. You probably have those moments when food doesn't mean anything, no sleep doesn't mean anything. You're just completely in your, what's the word? Zone. Where you're completely in your zone. And energy is flowing free through you into the world. And I don't care if that means reward, accolades, or attention. Right? So I've got a video to show you. It's a 10 minute video. And then we'll talk about it some we'll try to wrap up after that. Well, I have about 10 minutes. Okay, so that means we just basically, I got the video yet. So we will watch the video the next time I come to do this talk when I have a little bit more time, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, so now, heading to the final stretch. Um, so the shift, we talked about what the shift is. So, you know, so we talked about what happens is not, the myths around it, and we talked about what uh, leads to happiness, contentment, and joy. So what creates this shift? The shift is created when society, uh, well, was, well, that society is dependent on all of us continuing to outsource our happiness. I think a famous example of this is, have you all seen that ad of Coca-Cola? Life is good with Coca-Cola. Marketing has got this amazing talent to make you feel that the ne next best thing is what is gonna make you complete. If you don't have that next best thing, how many people here have an iPad? Okay, some of you, right? So I'll tell you a little story about when I first saw the iPad, it's probably 2005 or 2006, I can't remember, somewhere, you know, six years or seven years, maybe more ago. A friend of mine, uh, I met him in New York, and he, iPad 1 had just released, and I, you know, he showed it to me, and I was just so excited about it. I'm like, why would I want that thing? I have a mobile phone, which does many of the features and functions, you know, of that thing. I have a pretty light laptop, which I could walk around, carry around anywhere. Why do I want to carry one more thing? Right? So I was clearly, you know, decided, you know, in my mind that I don't need an iPad. That was the first time my first, my first friend bought an iPad. My 20th friend bought one. 50th friend bought one, and my 80th friend bought one. And I tell you, you begin to question and say, maybe I'm incomplete. <laughs> <laughs> so there's that, that effect of how marketing makes you feel that way, the peer pressure that adds to the marketing that makes you feel that way. And I tell you what, till today I don't have an iPad, so I have stood by my value system. But the point here is that the media has amazing capability to make you feel completely you know, incomplete without buying that thing to make you feel happy, right? So to end our dependency on the external, to stimulate our feeling of happiness in the, in the internal would be a shift. And we'll talk about what, that, what those factors may be. Right now, we're all materially dependent on other living, others living the myth that happiness is a dependency. Let me tell you another story, a real quick story about when I first came to this country. I grew up in India, I was there until I was 23, I came to grad school in Austin, Texas. And when I was in grad school, I made good friends with one of my classmates was a boy who lived in South Texas. And some of you would know that, there's a town called Brownsville, and very water, and he had a ranch about 50 miles outside, north of Brownsville. And he invited to me to meet his house uh, for Thanksgiving. I was excited, you know, first uh, American holiday, right? So I go to his house, we drive down for hours, and we made it to his ranch, and you know, so his family lives on the ranch, and we, lived, you know, we went there. Um, and at that Thanksgiving dinner, uh, I found out something very interesting, and you know, we had you know, some good, you know, really good conversations. And I heard that Christmas and Thanksgiving tend to be some of the most stressful times in the year. <laughs> I don't have to finish my statement, some people are nodding their head, they get what I'm, what I'm going with this. I understand that people sit and bicker and fight and quarrel about what somebody said 20 years ago. <laughs> I mean, I don't get this part, I'm sorry, but you know, I don't understand, it's culturally it was a new thing for me, now I'm getting it. When somebody spends thousands of dollars to fly their family, halfway across the continent to come together once or twice in a year to be with their family, 
you sit and fight about how you locked me up in the closet <laughs> when I was a seven year old. And then saying the rest of my life, I am unhappy. I'm, I am what I am because of what you did to me, not even now, but way back when. You see how subconsciously we let these kind of crazy things hold us down. So, everybody must have heard, if you haven't, Dale Carnegie, one of the greatest members of our American revolutions, uh, uh, industrial revolutions, he said, it isn't what you have, or who you are, or where you are, or what you are doing that makes you happy or unhappy. It is really what you're thinking about. And I have five more minutes, I'm going to share with you one scientific piece of evidence that researchers have been studying these days, uh, last 10, 15 years, but lately a lot more have work has been going on with EEG and MRI scans and so on and so forth, fMRIs and so on. So what they say is typically average human being has anywhere between 12 to 55,000 thoughts per day. Think about rice farmer in China, 12,000. Think about stockbroker in New York, very likely 55,000 thoughts per day or more. If you whittle that down to the per minute level, they say that typically a human being is having anywhere from 5 to 25 thoughts per minute. And what they're saying, interestingly, is that if you are in that range of uh, first of all, scenario, if you're in a scenario where, let's say you're at a beautiful beach in Hawaii, one of the most exotic places in the world, sitting and watching the beautiful sunset, and if your mind is whirring at a speed of 25 parts or greater, you're experiencing sorrow, peacelessness, and discontent. You guys get that? You're sitting on a beautiful beach and your mind is running at a speed of 25 thoughts per minute or greater. You are naturally unhappy and discontent. And opposite of that, you could be sitting in a fish market in India. And if your mind is working or your brain is producing thoughts at 5 minutes or less, 5 thoughts per minute or less, you are experiencing peace, contentment and bliss. How's that for data? Okay? You guys understand that? You guys have been to a fish market in India? Then how come you understand that? <laughs> okay, I'm just kidding. Alright, so moving on, we have a reflection, a meditation exercise. Okay, so let's do that real quick. I have some questions for you at the end of that. So let's sit down some So, I ask that you sit with your back straight, feet flat on the ground, arms rested. I ask that you start by taking in some deep, comfortable breaths. Breathe in to your stomach, not just into your lungs. Just like when a baby is sleeping very peacefully. You'll see the rise and fall of the stomach, not the chest. And when you learn to breathe in deep like this, you automatically begin to relax the body. Now, just step back and observe the thoughts that flash on the screen of your mind. Just look at them as if you're looking at a TV screen. Just observe without judgment, without resisting them. Or getting carried away by the thoughts. Just step back and observe what is flashing on the screen of your mind. You slowly notice the speed of your thoughts reducing. And as you stay detached from your thoughts without letting them take you into a story, 
to begin to become present. And that presence feels very comfortable. If any thought comes to take you away, distract you, just tell yourself, Victor, I want to stay in the state of presence for a minute, and then when I'm done, I'm going to come back to this thought. Notice where you feel yourself be present. The seat of consciousness, the seat of all memories, the seat of realizations, sits right inside your head. Somewhere just below the brain. Somewhere just behind the eyes. Somewhere between your ears. This is the center of all consciousness in this body. This is the state of being the here and now. In the state of being, what happens to time? becomes irrelevant. Does the being need anything to become complete? The being is complete. It's only a question of realizing Does the being need any knowing to become any more than what it is? The wisdom that I need to be what I want to be is within me. It's a matter of tapping into that great resource of wisdom. Does the being need anything to do any better? The being is already yourself this question. What does authentic happiness mean to you? Thank you. You may want to note down some of the feelings, the realizations that you got to those questions, especially the last one, what does authentic happiness mean to you? Um, I'd like to just kind of 
wrap up here. What we've talked about today is real happiness is not a high or a low. It is not something that's acquired or can be accumulated from the outside. Neither is it a stimulation that is an excitement that comes and goes. It is not in anything or not cannot be found anywhere. It is an inside job, as we talked about. Obviously, if it can't be bought, if it can't be earned, or can it be stored, it certainly cannot be manufactured or prepackaged. So, I'll leave you with these four tips. Learn to meditate. If you already have a meditation practice, please use it. Practice it more unless you actually use it. Uh, we have lots of free online resources. LearnMeditationOnline.org is a great resource. Lots of videos and guided commentaries and so on, like the one you just heard. Spend time with like-minded people, friends, community, that have elevated goals in life. You become an average of the people you hang out with. Right? So that's a philosophy that is good to remember. Make time to, be what, make time to remember what you're grateful for. Gratitude is a very important element in how I am feeling. The opposite of gratitude is entitlement, folks. That is the drain for your state of well being and happiness. This is my email. I write a weekly blog if you're interested in keeping in touch, want to get updates, have any questions, hit me up with questions. Otherwise, I'd like to say thank you. <coughs> Stay happy. Shine on.